This is a presentation to uh, talk a little bit about uh, anesthesia for the pediatric patient. Um, certainly we see a, a number of pediatric patients um, in our practices, um, and a lot of these patients present special challenges um, because they're not probably a patient that we're doing every day. Um, we're often doing dogs and uh, cats who are uh, maybe a little bit older, we consider them young, but they certainly wouldn't be considered uh, necessarily the pediatric or neonic. So I just want to start off by sort of reviewing a few definitions and talking about some of the differences of the pediatric patient. Um, first of all, just for terms of this talk um, and in general, when I refer to a neonate, I'm really referring to uh, a puppy or a kitten under six weeks of age. Um, if I were speaking of horses, I would be probably speaking of an animal under uh, one to two weeks of age. Um, so this is what I would truly define as the neonate. And the neonates um, are obviously the most immature um, patients that we might anesthetize. Um, but really, probably the majority of the patients that we're going to anesthetize are what we'd consider pediatrics, um, those that are over 12 weeks of age. And interestingly enough, even though these animals are still relatively um, um, immature, a lot of their body systems are fairly well developed. Um, but what they really lack is they lack a... Uh, reserve capacity to tolerate some of the depression um, and changes associated with anesthesia. So I think another really important point to point out about uh, the pediatric or the neonate patient is that there is a real continuum in the development of uh, organs um, from birth basically until uh, adult age. And although may, many of these changes, as I've sort of alluded to, um, occur within the first weeks, that's the period of most rapid development, um, within the different breeds that we may see, that development may be slower um, or faster. So, you know, for example, in some of the very small breeds like the Chihuahua, they may actually mature somewhat faster than some of these larger breeds who may actually be a little bit slower. And so, so it's really hard to say exactly where each patient may be in the whole continuum from birth to, uh, you know, adult development uh, type uh, maturity. But nonetheless, um, you know, you do want to look at each patient as an individual, and certainly uh, you will see a lot of individual, individual uh, variation among these patients. So uh, usually when I start looking at anesthesia, and uh, when I'm discussing anesthesia, I really focus on some of the physiological and anatomical differences. And if we were talking about a disease, I'd really be focusing on, you know, what is the pathophysiology of the disease? Because if we can understand the foundation of the changes in the patient, and if we understand the mechanism of action of our anesthetics and our anesthetic drugs, then we have a better ability to predict what will happen when we combine these two things. So what happens when you combine the anesthetic drugs with the neonatal patient um, with their, some of their unique physiological and anatomical differences? Um, what happens to the patient with, um, let's say, diabetes and um, you know anesthetics? And so by understanding diabetes and all its associated um, effects and changes, we can make better anesthetic related decisions. So, so really a lot of what we do in anesthesia is trying to really understand those fundamental changes and, uh, and characteristics of the disease or of the patient, um, you know, be it a horse or a dog or a cat, there's certainly differences. So, so I think this is a real um, foundation of the way I try and teach anesthesia and try and have others um, understand it. So when I'm talking about the neonate or the pediatric patient, and really from this point on, I think I'm just going to refer to these patients as pediatric patients. Um, I really want to focus on um, the cardiovascular system, the respiratory system. These would be the two major systems that uh, we'll see a lot of cardiovascular um, and respiratory depression associated with our inhalants. Also, the renal and hepatic systems um, are important for um, uh, elimination of these drugs. And of course, the CNS system is the system that's going to be um, depressed by our anesthetic drugs. There's also some pharmacokinetic and, and pharmacodynamic changes that we'll uh, discuss, and these are really hard to predict. Um, and because of the way we tend to use our anesthetic drugs, uh, we usually can sort of, I wouldn't say avoid discussing these, but if we use our drugs wisely, um, some of these changes uh, won't be as significant as they could be, and I'm going to talk about that. The other thing that we can't really predict, and you know, I guess I, I, when I look at it from an anesthetic point of view, I can pretty much predict most of these physiological and anatomical changes, but I think the one thing we can't predict is the unrecognized congenital abnormalities. Uh, does the patient have a cleft palate? Is it, does the patient have underlying um, congenital heart de defects that could impact the anesthesia? 
And so these aren't very predictable, but these are things we're looking for because these are this, these patients, some of them, this is the first time they've actually been examined by us um, in the veterinary profession. So when we look at the cardiovascular system, um, I think we're all very well aware of the normal fetal circulation. Um, in the normal fetal circulation, certainly we have the uh, ductus arteriosus and the foramen ovale, um, which are both open in the, the fetal um, stages of life. Um, and which close shortly after birth. And of course, some of these um, remnants of fetal development may persist in the first few days of life. I would probably say that in my experience, I would see some of these remnants or these, um, these uh, normal anatomical um, developmental processes persisting. Uh, probably the patients I see this in most often would be the foals, um, where we're doing um, procedures in uh, neonatal uh, equine patients in the first one or two days of life where we may actually still have um, a patent for aminal valley and we can actually hear the murmur in the in the animal and we can sometimes hear the murmur become exaggerated in the patient. I wouldn't say I see that as commonly in our small animal companion patients, um, but nonetheless we look for those and look for those changes and if we detected a heart murmur, you know, we'd be asking ourselves the questions, is this a congenital you know, remnant, or is this a congenital remnant um, birth defect, congenital abnormality, um, and will it go away? So we want to be looking for these things. If we just talked about the general differences between neon or sorry, pediatric and adult circulation, in general, pediatric circulation is a lower pressure system, um, and they rely on a much higher heart rate um, in order to facilitate uh, adequate cardiac output. So as far as the low pressure system and the reason for this low pressure system, there's several of them. Um, first is that there's less contractile myocardial mass. Um, and because of this lower contractile myocardial mass of the patient, they have a limited ab ability to increase contractility to increase stroke volume and consequently increase blood pressure. So in other words, the stroke volume, so each time the heart pumps, they can't actually increase that volume very much. Um, and so they rely on a faster heart rate and the same stroke volume to maintain cardiac output. Another issue with these guys is they tend to have lower ventricular compliance. Um, and if we kind of remember, compliance is the ability of the heart to fill with blood. And so it starts to stretch, if you will. Um, and they have a little bit less uh, ability to stretch and to fill with blood. And so in responses to um, increases in preload, such as might happen with a fluid bolus, we don't see the same kind of increases in stroke volume as we'd expect from uh, an adult patient. Another factor that contributes to this low pressure system is that they don't have a very well developed sympathetic nervous system. And the central sympathetic nervous system is sort of the um, portion of the autonomic nervous system that really helps to regulate and maintain blood pressure along with several other systems in the body. Um, but certainly this is an important uh, factor. And so when these patients are subjected to various cardiovascular challenges, they can't really compensate as an adult would. Um, so if they become dehydrated or they have volume losses, they just don't compensate the same and have that ability to maintain blood pressure. And subsequently, if we give them anesthetic drugs, these drugs often will depress blood pressure or reduce blood pressure, so drugs such as acepromazine and inhalant anesthetics. Um, and these patients just can't compensate for these, uh, these vasodilatory effects as well as the adult patient would. Um, it's not to say that I would necessarily avoid them, and obviously you'll find, as we discuss the specific protocols, that obviously inhalants are a big part of what we use in um, pediatric patients. So I mentioned that they're heart rate dependent. And what I'm really referring to there is that cardiac output is really dependent on the heart rate um, and the low systemic vascular resistance. So again, these patients don't have a well-developed sympathetic nervous system. They tend to be a low-pressure system. So there's not much resistance to blood flowing out of the heart. And this is what the patient would normally experience and um, in a pediatric patient. They would do just fine under these circumstances. As we get older um, and as our development occurs, the systemic vascular resistance goes up um, and we become less dependent on heart rate for our cardiac output because also contractility increases, um, and our blood pressure overall will actually start going up. If we looked at some of the drugs that are going to significantly impact these um, parameters, um, in particular cardiac output and heart rate, um, alpha-2 agonists are probably um, the drugs that we would basically avoid in these patients unless we have an absolutely good reason to use them um, because these drugs definitely will um, cause reductions in heart rate 
um, and increases in systemic vascular resistance associated with it. Uh, limited cardiac reserve. Um, these patients don't have the same kind of cardiac reserve as an adult would have. And if we looked at uh, an adult patient, an adult patient can increase cardiac output by about 300%. Um, a neonate, on the other hand, is only about 30%. Obviously, a pediatric patient would be somewhere in between the neonate and the adult. I've picked the sort of two extremes here. So we're going to move on and talk a little bit about the respiratory system um, and how the respiratory system is impacted um, in the neonate and, and how it's developed. Uh, one thing, just sort of a, a general um, overall um, comment, is that the metabolic rate is higher and the oxygen consumption, therefore, is higher. And they do have tend to have a minute uh, ventilation that's greater, so they tend to either have a higher respiratory rate or tidal volume, and in the neonate or in the pediatric, it really depends to be a higher respiratory rate. So we anticipate having higher respiratory rates. Another issue is that they have decreased functional residual capacity. And functional residual capacity is one of those uh, terms that we often use when we talk about respiratory physiology, and it's somewhat hard to explain. Um, but the easiest way to think about it is functional residual capacity in your lungs is what basically allows you to hold your breath. Um, and functional residual capacity in these patients is relatively low, um, and so they basically can't hold their breath very long. Um, and so they don't tolerate uh, apnea very well, and they're more prone to developing uh, hypoxia. Another uh, factor we may see with uh, reductions in functional residual capacity is that patients tend to move plane of anesthesia much quicker, quicker when we're using inhalant anesthetics. Um, I could give you another example of patients with uh, reductions in functional residual capacity, and this would be uh, the pregnant patient. Um, because the diaphragm can't expand or can't drop the way it normally would want to, we'll also see these patients having a, a reduction in functional residual capacity, which will then lead um, to a greater likelihood of developing hypoxia. They do have a greater work of breathing. Um, if you look at a neonate and watch the way they breathe, their chests are extremely pliable and rubbery-like. Um, and so their chest cavities, they tend to have to do a lot of work to expand against the pliability of the chest. The chest wants to collapse down quite small. Um, and so it is a lot of work for these patients to breathe. And they are susceptible to fatigue and potentially hypoventilation. I don't think I've seen many patients during an anesthetic procedure have these problems. Um, and certainly if I did suspect this, I would start to uh, ventilate the patient. But if we had a, a patient with respiratory disease, for example, a pediatric or neonate patient, they're more likely to go into respiratory failure than an adult just because the, the work of breathing associated with their disease situation and then put on top of that the fact that they have these very pliable rib cages, um, they are going to be more prone to um, respiratory uh, fatigue and uh, failure. <clears throat> Another issue uh, associated with the uh, increased work of breathing is they do have very narrow airway diameters. And if you kind of remember the old equations that uh, airway resistance through a tube um, is, uh, is, is, is related to the, the diameter of the airway, um, and it's a fairly significant um, relationship. As we increase airway diameter, we significantly reduce resistance. Um, the length of the tube is also important, but probably the diameter, well, we know the diameter is much more important. It's a, a factor of squared. Uh, the other uh, issue associated with this respiratory system is that they will tend to be more sensitive to uh, drugs with muscle relaxing properties, so things such as the benzodiazepines, or although we don't use them very often, the uh, neuromuscular blocking agents. Uh, Pediatric patients, in particular neonates, also have a somewhat immature ventilatory control. Uh, the carotid bodies are not as responsive to uh, changes in oxygen content in the blood, and therefore they may not be stimulated to change their respirations appropriately um, in situations where they do become somewhat hypoxic. 